Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, this is Matt Chat, episode 444. Uh, the first part of an interview series with Mr. Kevin Saunders. Now, if you don't know that name, you probably should. He's worked on a lot of uh, great games, including Knights of the Old Republic 2, uh, Torment Tides of Numenera, uh, Mask of the Betrayer, just to name a few. Uh, anyway, I was really honored to get to talk to him. He's uh, been going through some pretty rough times, as you'll see in this interview series. So I was especially grateful to uh, Kevin uh, for taking the time out to talk to us and let us know a little bit about what it's like uh, being in his shoes. Uh, anyway, uh, we cover a lot of ground here, including uh, discussions of Torment, Kickstarter, uh, his work on Idhara, uh, an Oregon Trail-like game, and much, much more. Anyway, there's a lot to uh, see here, so without further ado, here is Kevin Saunders. Hello, folks. I am here today with Kevin Saunders. He is a designer, director, and producer. A lot of hats there, Kevin. Uh, he's best known for his work on, uh, let's see, Star Wars, Knights of the Old Republic 2, uh, The Sith Lords. I bet you've probably heard of that one. Uh, Never Wonder Nights 2, uh, Mask of the Betrayer, Storm of Zahir. Uh, Z- I always get the pronunciation of this wrong. Zahir, I think. <laughs> we, we called it Zahir, but Zahir. I'm not sure what the official... <laughs> yeah, just had Annie on. We were talking about this. Zahir. Uh, anyway, Storm, as we'll call it. <laughs> well, uh, let's see. Torment Tides of New Manera, a little more recent. He's a veteran of several companies, Obsidian Entertainment and Exile. He's played a number of senior design roles and production roles. He's also credited on Wasteland 2, The Director's Cut, Alpha Protocol, uh, even on Dungeon Siege 3. Now, I'm honored to have him on, talk about these and other projects. Hopefully get some insights into what he's learned over the years, all these different companies and different roles. How are you doing today, Kevin? Above average. Thank you, man. How are you? Doing great. Thank you. Uh, so I thought we'd do things a little different. I usually start off with uh, start, start talking about the oldest projects and work our way uh, towards the future. But I thought this time, just for fun, we could start with the most recent stuff and then work our way back in time. Sure. Just try that out. And I had a question I thought might be good to start us off with. This is from Jack Chandler. And he wrote in to ask, what are you working on lately, and what would your dream project be? All right, so I'm currently working at Embodied, which is a robotic startup whose founders include a former CTO of iRobot. And there I'm a principal natural language processing designer. Um, NLP, and hmm. um, I. So I, it was my first individual contributor role in a long time, and more recently I was placed in charge of our NLP development group. Though actually I've been on a leave of absence since uh, July. Um, last year I was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. Hmm. And so I had liver surgery um, that was um, of mixed success. And I'm currently undergoing a, a fairly rigorous chemotherapy regimen. Uh, my, um, my oncologist gives me um, some, some odds of, of surviving the next five years. Um, it's possible that I'm cured now, but statistically speaking, it's more likely I'm, I'm not. Um, and even if, if I make the next five years, then have about a 50, 50 chance of surviving the next five after that. Um, so that's, that's affected a lot of my perspective on, on work. Uh, so Embodied has been very supportive and generous in this process, and I look forward to returning there mm. in March. Um, so in terms of a dream project, at, at this point, um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know that I have um, the time for that, and and I won't know until I until I don't. Um, uh, one of the things I've learned in my uh, my impromptu medical research over the last few months is, um, you know, with cancer you don't know that you're cured. 
you're just not, there's no, so, so I currently have no evidence of any problem. In fact, I've never had any symptoms from the actual cancer. There's just mm -hmm. all the side effects have been from uh, the treatment. Um, and my situation is somewhat atypical. And so there isn't even clinical evidence that the chemotherapy is beneficial. That improves my chances of surviving. Um, but I, I feel, I, I felt I needed to do something um, and so that's the, that's the best medicine has currently. Mm. Well, I'm sorry to hear that about that, Calvin. You seem to be handling it well. Well, it's it's interesting. I think it's the kind of situation where it's um, it, it can be worse um, hearing about someone else having the situation than being in it yourself. Um, the the part that's hardest for me is. I have a son who's 10 and a daughter who's seven. Hmm. Um, and they know that I'm being treated for cancer. Um, but like their grandfather, my father-in-law, um, he had colon cancer and he seemed, he was treated and, and in, is in remission and seems fine. So they don't, um, we've, I think we've successfully shielded them from um, an understanding of, of the likely outcomes. Um, so the thing that I, I dread the most is the day when I have to tell them mm -hmm. that, that I will be with them much longer. Well, I certainly wish you all the best. Thank you. And maybe I'm fine. I just won't know. I well, certainly hope so. Okay, so let's get back to a little bit earlier than this, continuing with our reverse chronology. So you had emailed me about a game that you had been working on with a couple of people called, it. I think this is called Adhara? Yes. Adhara, uh, a co-op Oregon Trail in a stylized fantasy world. I'm a big fan of Oregon Trail. I remember playing this playing that game. I even have a couple of the shirts with the you have know, diet of dysentery. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. You know, I find that for some reason that nobody in Europe seems to none of my European friends have ever heard of the game for whatever reason seem seems to be usually the case. But anyway, can you talk a little bit about this at horror project? Yeah, so I was hired um so later in the interview we'll get back to the beginning of my career, which was at, at Nexon and um so this most recent job before Embodied. Um, I was hired at Nexon to create a new development studio in the US. So Nexon is a very big Korean company um, that's famous for games like um, Maple Story and some of the some early massively multiplayer online games. Uh, these days a lot of um, they have a, a big presence in the mobile space and um, they, all the development is in Korea and then localized in the U.S. So I was hired to create a new studio that would make games in the U.S. And so we um, explored a variety of concepts. Um, we would do some paper prototyping. Um, and what we ended up gravitating towards that got started getting a lot of momentum in the team was this, was this game, which we called Atara. And... It was um, sort of a, a real-time strategy type game, but you didn't have, you didn't build units. Um, it was cooperative multiplayer against uh, against the AI. And one thing, and and I'm still not sure if we would have if we would have been able to solve this um, solve this well enough. But you know, so some RTS games will have an escort mission, and oh, escort yeah. missions are almost always bad. <laughs> the dreaded and escort mission. Decided, <laughs> yes, we we focused on the escort mission. We're going to make it be an escort mission. We're going to make it be fun, and so there'd be a caravan that you would have to um, that you would have to protect against. Um, there was there was uh, environmental hazards to deal with, and you had tools to deal with those. And there were monsters, and you'd have to go and and find the sources of the monsters and take them out before they could destroy your caravan. And then your caravan would have its own um, defenses as well. And we, mm. we ended up, we, we fairly quickly 
um, reaffirmed that escort missions aren't fun. So we made the caravan stationary for the purposes of like when you're doing the mission. And so we brought that to a uh, green light um, and the prototype was in good, um, was was pretty fun. Um, and the, the setting was uh, designed by Neil Halford, who worked on... Ah, Neil Halford, sure, yeah. Yes. yes. Great friend and of mine. Wrote the book on fact, RPG when, design. Yes. Um, in fact, when I interviewed him for the role, I used your interview with him <laughs> no as, as great background <laughs> material so that I knew like who I was talking to and what he was like. Um, and he did a great job developing um, this... I guess I can reveal the secrets now since the game will never exist. Uh, but it was a fantasy a setting that felt like a fantasy setting, but underneath it was actually, you know, about a thousand years in the future from today. Hmm. And so maybe 90% of that we would never explain to the players, but there'd be 10%. So it'd be, there'd be fantasy, but sort of over time you would, you would sort of uh, realize some of where everything was coming from. Um, yeah, I really like so that, those documents that you share with me. Do you mind if I show those documents, by the way, that you sent? I think that would be fine. I was told that I'm allowed to include such things in my portfolio, in our portfolios. Um, so I think that's fine. Can, well, that's really intriguing. I'll, I'll see if I have anything else that would be appropriate. I thought it was an interesting way not just to explain the game, but also to market the game. You know, the, the cartoon images and the description of the yes. pillars of game. Like the... I guess the sort of the fundamentals of the game design were laid out there in a nice... Well, I mean, I'll show the document. <laughs> so you can check this out. <laughs> and uh, Joseph Navier was my art director. And so Very he, well he, done. Uh, yes, yes. And Hayden Dalton, um, who worked on um, Darksiders. Oh, sure. Um, and uh, he was a, a creative director. We had a team of about 10 people. And... Um, we, we were going against the grain in that we were trying to make a PC game and we were trying to make it be a, like a, a premium game where you'd buy it and that be it and no microtransactions. And Nexon is kind of the origin of the microtransactions. And I'll, I can talk more about that later. Um, and so this was against the company's grain, but... Um, um, uh, but I was told this was a this was a route to pursue um, that was okay for us to pursue. Um, mm-hmm. But in the end, um, I think I think Nixon decided this experiment was was not the right one for them at this time, and so um, so we were shut down. That's too that's too bad. I never understand. This is kind of mystifying to me why some these decisions happen sometimes. So. Yes, I mean that company <sighs> now is over four. Where at the time with over four thousand people, um, and so I'm not sure. Like, oh, I'm sure all kinds of things happen at the upper echelons in terms of making such decisions. So, but it was it was a lot of fun building up a team completely from scratch and getting them to congeal and work together to make something. Uh, so let's talk about Torment Tides of Numenera. It's a game that's come up quite often here at a match yet yes. you know i was just thinking when i was uh coming up with some questions for you that you know i can remember back in 2011 sort of the pre-kickstarter days and the pre-crowdfunding days i had brian fargo on and we were sort of talking about like well why was it there ever a new waste why was there never a wasteland two? <laughs> the kind of questions came up and he sort of explained well there's just no publishers who are interested in anything like that and that was just the reality uh, back then. Of course, now we have all these tools. You know, so I thought it'd be neat to get your take on, maybe, you know, about Torment, obviously, but, you know, how all these uh, crowdfunding options have, and not just the crowdfunding options, but also the digital distribution, I think, has paved the ways for a lot of independent game development that wasn't there before. So how do you think all this has disrupted the status quo, if you will, of what it's like to make a CRPG. Well, I think it's great. So I grew up playing games in the 80s, 
you know, like the, the early Ultima games, the Bard's Tale games, like, like all of us older gamers did. Yeah, I was looking at your shirt. It looks like you got this game on your shirt. I can't quite make it up. This is um, Astro Smash on the Intellivision. Oh, I don't know. That's... <laughs> Which was... <laughs> That's something you don't see every day. No. When I was six, my, the first game, I guess maybe the second game I made, was a port, in quotes, of Astro Smash for my dad to got a ZX81 with uh, one kilobyte of RAM and a cassette tape deck. And it, oh, I mean, yeah, it was the, the ZX. Where were you living? Were you, you in the U.S.? Massachusetts. Well, how'd you end up with that? Massachusetts. My dad was a, is an electrical engineer, and so he was into computers. So I think we had a little, I had some of those things a little earlier. And it was, it was only it was a hundred dollars, which was more then than now, but still not not that pricey. Mm-hmm. And uh, we he also got this this memory extension pack that you could plug into the back of it that gave it sixteen kilobytes of memory, Whoa. which was amazing. <laughs> but the problem was it wasn't it didn't fit in that securely, and so sometimes I'd be working on something and like bump it and oh, and no. it, it's gone. Um, but so so my version you had a little ship that you could move along the bottom. And one asteroid would come down at a time. You could move under and shoot it. It was terrible, but it was inspired by <laughs> my Astro Smash. How, how old were you? I was six. Six? <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> well, well, the ZX81 made it, they, they had shortcuts. Like, so, like, P would put out the word print. So to program, you didn't even have to type all the letters. So it was... It was oh, nice. Years. Honestly, I haven't had too many people talk about the, the ZX... Yeah, one. It's usually the Apple II seems to be the go-to. Yes, that, yeah, that was more that was more common, I think. And we had those in schools, but they were more expensive. That was, that was too expensive for us. But um, and actually, I, I speaking of crowdfunding, I crowdfunded the work on the on the Spectrum, which is what it was called in England, I think. And so they're making they're remaking it. So hope to get that sometime in the near future. <laughs> and a lot of my European fans are probably like, "Yay, woohoo!" <laughs> it's a great system. I love the, the look and the design of it. Yeah, yeah, it was really slick at the time too. And all those um, games where it has that unique sort of aesthetic that looks like some kind of a, I don't know how to describe it, like some kind of bizarre Mad Magazine cracked kind of look to some of the art of those games. I mean, I, I like I like I love playing the Rockstar Eight, my hamster. Uh, if you remember that one, no, I and don't. Apparently, I don't. that was a specky a specky game. They made it to hmm. the Commodore sixty four. So there's a couple of games like that. And I didn't you realize until much later in life that this thing originated on the the Spectrum. Yes. Huh. Yeah, later, we had a, a Commodore sixty four at that, that I used. So, so anyway, so. Back to your. Sorry, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love. The, I, I can talk about classic computing all day. That's my one of my great passions. Get in television. And oh so yeah, that, I yeah, love the, the television. Where did that come in? Oh, you were playing the television and you made a port. That's where, the, that's where this, okay. this game's from. Gotcha. Uh, um, uh, so back then, so the games like the, like the Ultima and um, also like Wizard's Crown, Eternal Dagger. Oh sure. So these were all games made by small groups of people, and right they were there. great. Yeah, there we go. Um, and so the fact that now it's easy for a small group of people to make to make games again, mm-hmm. um, and we've seen already a, a lot of really high quality examples of that. I mean, we look at things like Darkest Dungeon and FTL, um, and so having the the better tools and a way to distribute and a way to reach fans is um i think great for innovation and great for letting people pursue their their creative interests and ideas um it lets people in some cases develop games as a hobby in a way that was harder to do before um which i think is is that part is important because really most of the independent games won't be as successful as the ones i listed i'm sure there are many many great ideas that people have implemented out there that I'll never see because I won't find them. Mm-hmm. Um, so from an innovation perspective and from being a, allowing 
more people to tap into their desire to create content and not just consume it. Uh, I think it's been it's been terrific. Um, crowdfunding, I have I have some mixed feelings on. Um, one of the things that it's helped people understand a lot more, players understand a lot more how hard it can be to make games, but I still think there's a big discrepancy between the expectations and the reality. Um, so we raised over four million for Torment, which was record breaking at the time on Kickstarter. And while four million is a lot of money for like a person um, <laughs> Yeah, I'll take four million. <laughs> To make a whole game, that's that's still not really a lot of money, um, and so there, you know, there'll be Kickstarter projects where they're looking for like sixty thousand, and I, I suppose, or you know, some some amount that clearly isn't enough to make a game. Now, if it's sort of your hobby and you want some money to help support that, then that works. But if you're having to pay a team and it's more than a couple people and they're maybe a little older and have more financial responsibilities. Um, it's not, it's still not realistic. I'm just out of curiosity, what, what would it be, what would be more realistic, you think, maybe? Would 40 million have made a huge? 40 million would have been more than I would have wanted. Um, and what are we, what's sort of the, the range of, we're talking about here? I mean, I, I think for a game, you know, like, like Pillars or like Torment, um, I mean, I, I think more in the order closer to 10 million mm -hmm. would have been enough to make it everything people wanted it to be. Um, we're still not talking, you know, like the, the triple a cinematics and whatnot. And there's a lot of other frills that I think are not really necessary for a good yes. role playing game. Um, but the, the biggest factor in the quality I, I feel and this isn't an original idea, but is the amount of time and energy you have to iterate. Like the, fir the first draft is always problematic. Um, so like the first area you make is gonna be the worst area in the, in the game. And hopefully you have time at the end to come back and iterate on mm -hmm. it. Um, but really hopefully you have time to come back and iterate on it three or four times. Um, and sometimes we, we often get to do some iteration, but not to the point that it's all as polished as we want it to be. Now, the more time you spend planning up front, the better situation you're in. But if you spend too much time planning, well, then you're not making progress on the game and maybe on, on making the content. And, and maybe there are assumptions you have about how the gameplay will work that don't hold up and then require big changes that invalidate a lot of your planning. So there's mm -hmm. some balance of planning enough so that your your moving towards the correct goals, but at the same time implementing and prototyping and developing so that you're, you're validating mm -hmm. your ideas. Uh, and this is one reason expansions are much easier to work on than the first game because you have the tools are, mo are at least mostly working. Right? A game has been shipped with the resources and pipelines that you have available. And so there's less energy on that and a lot more on the content itself. Um, and when you're making a game initially from scratch or from using one of the existing engines, most of your energy is just making things work and, um, and not about making the quality. You have to get to a certain mm -hmm. point before you're able to focus on the content in a way that fits what you can do technically. Yeah, that makes it makes a lot of sense. You know, one of the things we had talked about too with the Kickstarters, and something I've thought a lot about is which, which, what kinds of Kickstarters get the attention, you know, and get people pledging. And you know, one of the things about the uh, Torment game was the connection, of course, yes. to <laughs> a certain game that people have very fond memories of, quite justifiably uh, so. Uh, but it, you know, there's lots of I guess there's lots we could unpack here, because I've talked to a lot of uh, designers and developers over the years, and you know they said, well, it's always kind of been like this. You know, you 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 have these document designs, you have these plans, 
and features and things you want to implement, but then reality is you you know things happen along the way. You can't get this done. The publisher demands that the game be published, <laughs> and they can't give you an extra yes. six months or an extra year. So it's kind of routine uh, not to have features in there that were originally part of the plan. And, but I, and I guess that's been going on all this time. But for some reason, with the Kickstarter, since it's so public. You know the the fans don't take it very well. I don't know if they necessarily take it worse than the publishers or not, but there just seems to be more hype around. Like, well, you you promised this and a stretch goal, and it didn't. Yes, <laughs> it didn't pan out. So, you know, I, I kind of hear what you're saying is it's kind of a a plus and a minus, I guess, with this crowdfunding. Right, I find at least my ideas take a long time to fully develop. Like there might be an initial idea that's decent, but it's over time that so I recognize how all the pieces fit together and how it becomes something really compelling. And so through the course of development, even there might be a feature that initially looked like a great idea, but then you realize how it doesn't quite fit or how it would fit much better if it were shifted in some way. And um, it's really challenging to come up, if you, if you get into the details, to at the beginning of the project be able to commit to them. And then once, if you are, so if you have a contract with a publisher where you are fully committed to things, you waste a lot of energy doing things that actually aren't helping the game as much, but you need to check the box. And mm -hmm. that's required for you to get paid. Um, with crowdfunding, the, that that part is gone. And that, well, you have the money. Um and but you still have the backers have the expectation and even as much as you say up front you know we can't guarantee that all of this stuff will happen in this way but we can guarantee we'll make the best choices we can to adapt mm -hmm. to deliver on this type of experience you can outline the vision and stay true to the vision but if someone was really excited about like a crafting system and then it turns out to just not be a good fit then they're going to be disappointed um, and there are people who do look who do look that you whether or not you check the boxes, and if they have some other gripe, then that gives them ammunition to. to yeah, and they tend to have the loudest voices on the social media too, right? This... Yes. Which I mean, is, which is fair. I mean, if during the campaign we say there's a stretch goal and you make if we raise this much, we're going to add this feature. Um, but I think I think this is. I hope it was understood then, and I think it's understood more now it's not as if okay adding crafting is going to cost a hundred thousand dollars and we know that so we add it in the stretch goal a hundred thousand dollars away it doesn't work that way we can't predict things nearly that that closely but what we do know is more money lets us do more things um and so we do have thoughts of ways we could expand it and that, that's part of the crowdfunding that i I really dislike and disliked during the Torment Kickstarter also is there was a pressure to be providing stretch goals. Hmm. Uh, and yet uh, we haven't progressed enough in developing the game to know what responsible ones would be. One of the main things that I did with Torment stretch goals to the extent that I influenced them was looking at the things that Wasteland 2 promised and the things that Pillars promised. Mm -hmm. And here, okay, we're raising a similar amount of money. They said on Pillars they can do a crafting system. We can probably make it work out too, especially if we're, you know, if we're at the time, I don't think it had happened yet, but I was intending to license the Pillars engine mostly for the conversation tools, mm -hmm. which I've seen having worked there for so long. Like their conversation system is the best, best in class. And so I knew that would be well worth it to us um, and being able to modify them in the ways that were good for our project. And also, uh, we didn't have a solution to the 2D environments, and they did already. Mm. And so we'd save a lot of time. So I definitely wanted to license it for at least those two things. And maybe there'd be some gameplay stuff that would be relevant to it. That turned out to be less helpful, but that wasn't really what we were looking for. It was really those two, the, the pipeline aspects. Um, but so... So for this amount of money, these people think it's possible. And, you know, internally in Wasteland, and at the time we of the Torment Kickstarter, we were still expecting Wasteland to ship that October. 
Um, so since so we should be able to figure out a solution too. So things felt felt safe that we would solve it, but but still not. Um, in general, I think a game you want it to be as focused as possible. You want as few moving mm -hmm. parts as you can have to get the experience you want. That's how you'll get the high quality. Yes. Um, it, it's a, a little trickier, I feel, with RPGs because there's such a broad feature set that sort of all RPGs are expected to have. And if you're missing too many of them, like maybe you can miss a couple things, but if you're missing too many, then it starts Is to feel like... Is this even an RPG at this point? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, so I think uh, I, I completely understand the, 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 the backer, backers being disappointed when they don't get what we had hoped to deliver. But it's, it's never... I, I always was sincere about my motivations with things. Like whenever we made changes that would um, maybe make some backers unhappy, you know, trying to think about what is best for the game and what best meets the the vision, like with the resources we have to hit the vision, to mm -hmm. provide the experience we told them about, but not whether or not it provides the exact specific things we said we would. And then to try to explain that also. Like, okay, we made this change. Um, mm -hmm. Like one one thing that on, in Torment, there were the mirrors, which became these complex choose your adventure kind of episodes. I and that those. was, and I, yeah, I, I thought that worked out. Uh, I, was, I thought that was a very promising approach. Now, at one point, we imagined each of those might be its own area. Right? It would have been the double the size of the game. Um, and when you know, we, we found the torment areas were a lot more customized, so we put, in order to present the world well enough, they had to have a lot more custom detail in them than areas in Pillars of Eternity. So in part for that reason, so we, we knew you know, we had a good relationship with Obsidian. We knew roughly how what they were planning in terms of content, in terms of number of areas. But for us, it took a lot longer to make areas. And so the mirrors all being separate areas, that was not realistic. And so here's another solution that, that fulfills the role. Maybe, and in the end, I think it's even better. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it varies up the gameplay some as yeah. well. And as the more focus on, you know, some, the, some, two, some great 2D art um, and fits the sort of literary flavor of, of torment. It kind of reminded um, me of <clears throat> flipping, you know, just before this interview, I was flipping through some of my old game books. And it kind of felt like that, some of the old... Uh, I was looking through some of the Planescape books the other day and all these scenarios in there and you, you kind of wonder, like, I wonder what that would be like. Mm, and, and somehow mm -hmm. that just sort of, it was like that, the pages were coming alive somehow. It was, it was very nice. I liked the way that that was uh, handled. You know, something I was thinking about oh, with these Kickstarter stretch goals and, you know, I could see from the backer point of view, maybe from the uh, the the uh, people putting on the Kickstarter, like you want to be able to say, well, if we reach this amount of money, then we'll put it in a crafting system. You know, crafting that's going to get people excited. But really, what would be better is if we <laughs> sounds like what you're saying. If we reach this level, then we'll be able to iterate this again. You know, if we reach this goal, we'll be able to go back through it yet again, and that would really make it for a much better game than just sort of adding on this crafting system. Right. There, there could be some better I uh, some better way to use those those resources um and and i'm not i think in more recent times some of the crowdfunding campaigns have have promised less in the way of stretch goals um but back in back in that era that was more the thing you were supposed to do and again you figure well we'll make it work we'll figure out how to make it work and <laughs> it's in part a resource problem but part is also just all the pieces fitting together nicely and so sometimes like not only is there more work to put in a stronghold or a crafting system uh, the stronghold or, or whatever <laughs> but but it also actually makes the game worse if by doing it like it's better to it wasn't necessary maybe and putting more energy in something else would have made everyone happier um 
So and that happens in the course of development of of other games too. It's just it's invisible to people, to the players. Like they don't know all the things we, at the beginning of the project we were thinking of putting in, and how many of them we cut or modified along the way. Because um, internally we said up front these are things we'd like to do, but we didn't certainly didn't tell the would be players. Um, and so uh, so crowdfunding has shed this light on a process that um that was very obscure before and in a way that you know is not um you like to think that people are experts and that they make all the right decisions and know everything they're doing but we all make even even with expertise we make mistakes and and we don't know all the answers we don't know exactly how much it costs to do x um, and, and software development in general, that's, I think that's very hard to estimate. I mean, you can get it within an order of magnitude, maybe. <laughs> um, but, or, or, or if it's something like an expansion, then you've made a game previously, you know how long it took to do those areas, and you, have, you, can, you can make better guesses. Um, and actually, this is something that, um, I don't know if this, 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 maybe this is too much of a tangent, but it comes to mind. So with my my medical challenges, I've been, I, sh I should have known this going into it, but it amazes me how little doctors know. Every like I've seen maybe six different specialists, surgeons and oncologists, and each person I talk to, there's a different take. There's a slightly different recommendation. There's sometimes drastically opposing recommendations. Sounds and good. I, I you know, when you're when you're sick with a cold, here take these antibiotics, and here's the answer, and it works. But in this case, here's some information. You you decide what you want to do. Here are your options, and and I'm not going to decide because this is your life. Um, and uh, so so experts, while they have a lot of knowledge that others don't, that doesn't mean that they're precise in all ways. And so in game development. The, the same thing we don't the best we have is is you know um historic information on on things we've done before and we have a good sense so torment's funding goal was nine hundred thousand. if we had made nine hundred thousand, that was it we still would have made a game we would have been a much smaller team it would have been focused in different ways we would have but we would have figured something out to try to deliver that type of experience if we had raised 10 million dollars um, well, hopefully we wouldn't have kept adding stretch goals and it would have been a $10 million <laughs> version of what we talked about at the end. You might have a star citizen effect there. At... <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I, I still can't understand that phenomenon entirely. I, I, I'm very curious how that all ends. But, yeah. <laughs> I think we all are. <laughs> <laughs> And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. We are, of course, uh, still wishing uh, Kevin the best with his, uh, you know, his treatments. Hope everything is going well, as I'm sure you do as well. You know, it is, uh, you know, times like this, I'm especially feeling sort of humbled and you feel sort of the responsibility on your shoulders to try to, you know, make sure this history is recorded, that we have these stories available uh, so that uh, people from on, you know, 10, 20, maybe even 100 years from now will be able to come back and, and watch stuff like this and learn from it. Uh, of course, I also want to thank you very, 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 very much for doing uh, your part to, to preserve this history, to keep these uh, episodes coming. You know, it's a lot of fun doing these, but of course, you know, sometimes it's also very uh, important work as well. So I just really appreciate your, uh, you doing your part. <laughs> <laughs> kind of getting a little uh, emotional myself here. So why don't we move on and do the news? Uh, okay, uh, quite a bit of uh, news items here. First up is... I just recently did a Matt Chat Live. You know, I used to do these uh, on Google Hangouts, Google uh, Hangouts on the air. It's a bunch of discontinued stuff. Anyway, I figured out a new way to do it with Zoom. And so I kind of did this one. It's, it's basically a trial run, but it turned out to be really fantastic. we got Julia Minamata of the Crimson Diamond, Francisco Gonzalez of Rosewater. You know, it turns out he's basically done like, it seems like hundreds of other uh, adventure games with using the... Uh, 
uh, Adventure Game Studio, I think it's called, AGS. And then I met Bradley Shurgi, an old, old friend of mine. Way, we go way back. Now he's done some books on Juve Bowl, <laughs> infamous uh, Hollywood, or the infamous, I don't know where the guy's from, Germany, I think. Uh, anyway, he's done a bunch of video game themed movies. Uh, they're kind of known for being really, really terrible movies. I don't know why Matt uh, wanted to cover him so bad, like this multi-volume set of books. But anyway, I thought it'd be interesting to have him on, and it turned out to be. Uh, anyway, you can find the link to that in the show notes, and of course that is, uh, you know, a little, uh, uh, basically just a little reward, I guess, for my Patreon supporters. But uh, for the first one, I just made it open to the public, uh, so you can check that out. Uh, though, if in the future, though, if you want to make sure that you're getting those, all the Matt Chat stuff, make sure you're signed up on that Patreon site, and then you'll get, you know, whatever comes out, you'll have access to. All right, second item is uh, Stig Roden. Remember him? Uh, there's a new Blade Runner game, or rather a, re a remastered version of that Blade Runner game. Let's see. The, yeah, it was from 1997. So you might remember this old point-and-click adventure based on Blade Runner. Well, Night Dive Studios has decided to modernize that. They got a remastered version, updated character models and animations, upscaled cutscenes using machine learning algorithms, widescreen support, keyboard customization, much, much more. And they are set to launch sometime in 2020, and it will be uh, on PC, but also the consoles. Uh, so really exciting. Of course, you can get the original one for 10 bucks if you like. Uh, let's see, uh, there's also a Kickstarter out for a game that caught my eye. You might remember, way, I think one of my first match chats was one of my uh, favorite games from the Amiga days called Settlers. The Settlers, I think. <laughs> I played the hell out of that thing. Uh, but it's nothing has really scratched the itch. You know, there's been some games kind of like it, you know, but nothing has quite managed to capture, at least in my opinion. Uh, maybe this will be different, though. This is Surf's. It's a game, a medieval strategy game for PC by two brothers from Germany. So if you recall, the original Settlers was also from Germany, uh, so that's a good sign. <laughs> uh, maybe there's just something Germanic about this game, I don't know. Uh, anyway, build and manage your empires in a vibrant, gridless world. Create economies, wage great battles. Surface is all about building large production lines, expanding and conquering territory, and becoming the greatest emperor. I still got a little over two weeks left on this Kickstarter, trying to raise 55000 I still got quite a ways to go on that, though, so we'll see. Now, they do have a free demo available. You can try that out if you're not sure if you want to pledge. But if you do, it's 21 bucks to get the early bird pledge. Uh, they still got some slots left on that one to get a digital download. So I think it'd be a pretty good deal uh, if this manages to succeed. So if you like the Settlers, check out Surfs. Uh, and then finally, we have a... Uh, a big sell going on. So I, think, I think it was GameSpot posted this. Uh, so there's this site called Fanatical, and apparently they have uh, keys like Steam keys and other kinds of keys available. You know, I had never heard of the site before, but it's kind of a crazy sell going on right now. A lot of different kinds of games, but there are some CRPGs on here, and I sort of did some comparison, comparison shopping between this and Steam, and these games are way cheaper. Uh, so let me just list a couple here. Pathfinder, uh, the Kingmaker series, XCOM 2, Sacred 2, Risen 2, Dark Waters, Gold. I mean, it's, it's a bunch of good stuff here. Uh, they got eight days left on some of these deals, but they also have some that are expire within 48 hours. Some of these uh, savings go up to 75%. <laughs> They're basically uh, it's paying like 2 or $3 for games. It would normally cost you 15 uh, And I think the, I didn't write this down, but I know the Pathfinder ones are way cheaper too. I want to say something like maybe 50% off. Uh, so basically, if you haven't bought these games already, uh, you should definitely head over there, check out what's available, You'll probably find something that you like, and then you can just use the Steam key so you can play it on, on Steam. So pretty cool. All right, let's wrap it up with a quote. And, uh, you know, Kevin was talking a lot about this, you know, the problem of prom making promises and who's going to keep the promises and what if you're not in a position to be able to fulfill your promises, you know, and things of that sort. Uh, so I came across this quote by a true Renaissance man on the topic it goes something like this the promises of this world are for the most part vain phantoms and to confide in oneself and become something of worth and value is the best and safest course so some thoughts there by a certain michelangelo and not the ninja turtle 
<laughs> uh, anyway, guys, uh, ponder on that and see you next time. Please, please, don't make a fuss. I'm just plain yogurt.